Welcome to a new video lesson. In today's lesson, I will give an analysis of Gulliver's Travels Part 2, A Voyage to Brobdin Nags, Chapter 1. So, let's begin. Part 2, A Voyage to Brobdin Nag, Chapter 1. Chapter 1 starts with the description of Gulliver moving out of his home moving out of his country and again making a travel making a journey two months after his return to his country gulliver set sail again he was restless in his life and he again left his native country on 20th june 1702 in the ship named adventure whose captain was John Nicholas, a Cornish man, that is, um, a man from Cornwall, a man of Cornwall, okay. This uh, ship was bound to go to Surat, S-U-R-A-T. So, they had a, almost a good voyage. They were moving around they, till they reached Cape of Good Hope. And while they were moving, t uh, they could not leave the Cape of Good Hope till the end of March due to uh, the captain falling sick of an og, that is illness or uh, in that is in that involves fever and shivering. Okay, so they could not leave till March the Cape of Good Hope. They set the sail again. Uh, they had a good voyage till they passed the Straits of Madagascar. But having the north wind, northward wind of the island uh, to about 5 degrees is south latitude and the winds, they m moved around quite comfortably with constant wind. But on 19th April, the wind began to blow with much greater pace and towards much more western, western, westernly to the western side than usual, continuing to put them, continuing it for 20 days. And during this time, they were driven a little to the east of Moluka Island. This has been described all along the from the first two or three pages of the chapter one. Why I am narrating all this, I will be giving the analysis of this, the reason behind using all this description. Um, so, uh, as the captain found by the observation, he took the uh, second of May at which the winds has ceased. But they it was to little to rejoice he being the man of well experience his man in navigation of the seas he prepared that is the captain prepared them as to face against the storm again face the storm again which accordingly happened the following day for the southern wind uh, which was the southern monsoon wind began to set in. So what we see here is that Swift is constantly describing the naval adventure, naval jargon. The reason behind is that he is using this as a mockery. Okay, he again says that uh, he describes the different sails, the four sail which needs to be handed then making foul of the weather they took guns or the fast and handed the mizzen m-i-z-e-n mizzen means the lowest sail of so these are all jargons of uh, the shipping uh, shipping adventure right uh, these are not clearly known to people whatever uh, i will describe all this uh, then let me first describe uh, the incident first uh, there was a, 
a fierce storm the she a sea broke strange and danger in dangerous ways they would not get uh, down the topmost but at it let all strand and it scudded before the sea the ship was scudded the ship was a whole summer and it made better way through the sea seeing and had sea room when the storm was over they set the foresail and the mainsail and brought the ship to then they set the mizzen main top sail the fore top sail uh, and they chose the course of east northeast the wind was on the southwest he got to the starboard tracks uh, they set the lee braces and hauled forward the weather bowlings and hauled them tight okay during the storm uh, which was followed by the strong west the southwest uh, wind he computed that they were about uh, 500 leagues to the east they were moved to the 500 uh, leagues to the east so the oldest sailor on the board could not tell which part of the world that they were in their provisions held out well all the provisions of food and things were well but and the crew was also in good health but what they uh, lay shortage in was there was utter distress of fresh water water drinkable water and they thought it uh, would be best to hold on the same course rather than turn more northerly which might brought the northwest part of green tartary and into the frozen sea so what we see here is that many of the same issues that are brought up again but this time gulliver is in exact opposite situation but gulliver will be in exact opposite situation he, uh, he visited the uh, lilliputian land the lilliputs where he was the giant over there but in this brobdingnag province brobdingnag country or whatever you say this here he will be the lilliput he will be the minuscule one and all other residents of this place all other inhabitants of this place of that place would be the giants but before that in this uh, description of the sea what does swift actually try to uh, do swift makes a mockery of those who would try to demonstrate their expertise through convoluted language okay all the languages are not known to everyone all the words are not clearly known to everyone especially those technical terms which are associated to one profession only okay so um the attacks like this uh, like this one which are repeated elsewhere also in the novel are part of swift's larger mission what is that to criticize the validity of various kinds of expert knowledge that are more showy than helpful this expert knowledge was not uh, in any way helpful okay uh, this knowledge can be either uh, legal naval or in the third voyage as we will see uh, it is scientific so this kind of expertise knowledge are not at all helpful for the people but actually these are all showing off he describes in complicated naval uh, jargon the various attempts his ships makes to deal with the oncoming storm the rush of the words is nearly incomprehensible and it is meant to be so the uh, print the point is uh, to satirize the jargon 
used by the reader uh, used by the writers uh, of travel books and sailing accounts so as we all know this uh, piece of work is mainly focused on satirizing the tradition satirizing the society so here in this place the point is to satirize this printed material is to satirize all the kinds of things which are overdone in the society okay so the jargon used by the writers of the travel books or the sailing accounts are here criticized okay are here satirized so on the 16th day of june 1703 a boy on the ship who was on the top mast discovered a land on 17th they came a, came um, there came a view of the complete great island or a continent um, which was which it was later known on the south side where of was a small neck of land jutting out into the sea so they to uh, a creek to shallow to hold the ship and above 100 tons so they cast an anchor within the league and they desired um they desired to take a long boat with the vessel of water if they could find any water as they were as there was scarcity of water in their ships so he desired uh, to leave to go with them that he might see a new country and make new discoveries when they came to land they saw no river no spring or any sign of inhabitants the men therefore wandered on the shore to uh, find out some fresh water near the sea uh, and galiva walked alone somewhat about a mile on the other side where he observed the country all barren and rocky and now galiva began to uh, become we weary and seeing nothing to entertain his curiosity he returned gently towards the creek and the sea being full uh, in his view he saw his men already got into the boat and rowing for life to the ship he was go going to hola after them he was going to shout after them although it had been a little purpose when he saw a huge creature walking after them in the sea as fast as it could so when he returned after roaming around he saw that his men his uh, people had already climbed the ship and was uh, rowing to move far far away from the shore because he was trying to sh he was trying to shout galiva was trying to shout but uh, what he saw was there was a huge giant which was following the ship following his ship crew okay he waded Uh, into the uh, deeper than the knees to prodigious strides but uh, the men uh, were somewhat about a half a league ahead and the monster the giant was not able to overtake the boat and galiver was after was told that not to stay to see the issue of the adventure uh, but ran as fast as he could uh, the way that he first got he climbed up a steep hill which gave him some prospect of the country he found it fully cultivated but that which for surprised me 
was the length of the grass so here everything is above his size okay the length of the grass uh, which stood on the ground seemed to be kept for hay was somewhat about 20 feet high so the grasses were to his according to his measurement was somewhat 20 feet high he fell on the high road uh, so he took to be though he served to the inhabitants only as footpath along the field of barley he was an hour walking and ended in his in a field which was fenced in the hedge and somewhat at least um, 120 feet high and the trees so high that he could make no calculation of its um, great height it was impossible for him to climb uh, climb the steel and because every step was six feet high and the upper stone about 20 so he was wondering he was endeavoring to find some gap in the hedge when he discovered one of the inhabitants in the next field advancing towards the stile of the same says that he had saw pursuing the boat of his crew okay so he appeared as if uh, as tall as the um, uh, ordinary spire of steeple or uh, took about 10 years of every stride so with every step with every stride it shows as if he moved 20 uh, sorry 10 yards okay of human calculation the, of normal calculation he was awestruck and with fear also it struck with utmost fear to him when he saw him at the top of the stile looking back into the next field on the right hand and heard him call in a voice that were very loud louder than the degrees of a speaking trumpet as described by Gulliver the noise was so high in the air that at first he thought Gulliver thought that it was thunder so what we see here is that everything um, almost everything that was happening in Lilliput a voyage to Lilliput is being put in a situation which is completely opposite in Brobden Nag okay so the trees and everything were small there but here only the grass were 20 feet uh, high and the trees were so high that he could not make any calculation he saw seven monsters like him he saw seven monsters like the one of the inhabitants he saw which came towards uh, those person and reap, with reaping hooks in their hands so they were peasants they were farmers each hook what uh, Gulliver describes oh, had a largeness of six skites so they had the circumference the area of uh, of six sides of normal people these people uh, were not very clad at first uh, whose servants or laborers they seemed to be uh, they went on to reap the corn in the field where uh, when Gulliver lay it was impossible uh, for him to advance a step for the stalks uh, were very interwoven that he could Gulliver could creep through all the 
beards of the fallen years so strong and pointed that they pierced through his clothes into his flesh at the same time he heard the reports into hundred years behind him okay so as he was moving he could hear that the uh, area was being cut off area was being cut uh, reaped or uh, harvested from behind which was quite disputeful and e it might there uh, seem that he might be it might be his last day because uh, as he won't be seen here he could not be seen in this little miniature form he could easily be harvested or reaped off with the corns that was his thinking he lamented Uh, for his folly and willfulness in attempting to take a second voyage against the advice of his friends and relation relatives in this terrible situation he could not think uh, of the uh, lilliputian land whose inhabitants surely looked upon him as the greatest prodigy that ever appeared in the world where he was able to draw an imperial fleet in his hand and perform those other actions which will be recorded in their uh, history forever in the chronicles of the temper but here he has been put into a position or he has entered a position where his self importance has deteriorated he reflected what this nation uh, he reflected what a um, mortification that had proved to him to reappear as inconsiderable in this nation as one single lilliputian so here in brobdingnag he has become a lilliputian he is of the one single person who is the least important one for as human creatures are observed to be more savage and cruel in proportion of the birth what he could uh, expect but a morsel in the mouth for among the huge giants that are present in brobdingnag this philosophy would not have lasted it might have pleased fortune uh, to have let the lilliputians find some nation which people were diminutive with respect to them as they were to me and who knows that this prodigious race of mortals might be equally overmatched with some distant parts he was scared galiver was scared and confounded he screamed out loud as fear he was again about to move but his fear put him to a position where he could not move easily he looked upon the huge creature trod short and looking round and he, under him for some time at last espied galiver as he lay on the ground as galiver lay on the ground the giant considered a while with the caution of something and endeavor to lay hold on the small dangerous animal in such a manner so here galiver's importance has been decrease to such extent that he is to be considered to an animal and in this condition he we had sometimes done with the weasel in england as in england galiver had put um what can we say any insect within his 
fingers to check it he was also put in a same way he was carried in a same way okay he ventured uh, to take gulliver behind uh, by the in the middle between the four finger and the thumb and brought uh, within 3 yards of his eyes so the giant picked up gulliver from the ground with his four between his four finger and thumb and kept it very close to his eyes somewhat around 3 years to keep uh, to take a look at the shape more clearly he gulliver guessed this meaning and as good fortune gave him so the presence he resolved not to struggle uh, as he was held in the air somewhat above 60 feet from the ground okay so 60 feet means six floor building somewhat around six floor building or at least five floor whatever so gulliver did not try to struggle but he was still though he was being pinched from both sides very hardly for fear uh, that he would slip through the fingers and and if he falls he will surely die he never ventured to struggle he tried to raise his eyes towards the sun uh, and place his hands together in supplicating in posture to speak in humble melancholy tone uh, which was suitable for the condition uh, which was against him little harmful animal which he had mind to destroy but a good star that he had good fortune that he had he appeared pleased with the voice and gesture and began to look upon gulliver as curiosity so the ways in which he was behaving the ways in which gulliver was behaving met the giant please is with the situation so with the voice and gesture that he was doing the gulliver uh, sorry the giant seemed very curious of gulliver and was very pleased of it much wondering to his ear to pronounce the articulate words although gulliver could not understand them neither did the giant could understand gulliver's words in the meantime uh, what gulliver uh, able to think of the groaning and shedding tears and running in his head towards his side letting him letting him that is the giant know all these things how cruelly he was under the pressure of the thumb and the finger he seemed to apprehend the meaning and lifting up the lapter of of his coat he put gulliver gently into it and immediately ran along with gulliver to his master so the peasant who was walking there took gulliver in a much more light way and moved towards uh, his master who was a farmer the farmer uh, having suppose by the talk received the account from the servant could give and were with lifted him up the lapels of gulliver's coat which it seems he do to some kind of covering the nature had given me um he blew uh, gulliver's hair aside to take a, a better view of gulliver's face he called his hints about him gulliver had no uh, he then placed 
Gali was softly on the ground upon all the four people who were there. The farmer and the workers that were walking for him on the ground. So Gulliver was put on the ground. Okay. He Gulliver got up slowly and walked slowly backwards and for, uh, forward in between them and let those people see that uh, Gulliver had no intention of running away. They all sat down in a circle around Gulliver and to uh, have a better observation of his motion. In this position, the Gulliver was trying pulled off his hat and made low bow towards a farmer. He fell on the knees and lifted a, up his hand and eyes and spoke in several words as he as loud as he could. Gulliver took the parts of gold uh, from his pocket and put and presented it humbly to the farmer. The farmer received it on his palms and applied it close to his eye to see what it was. Afterwards, turned in several times that the point of the pin, which he took out of his sleeve, but could make nothing of it. Uh, while of, uh, uh, Gulliver made a sign that he should place his hand on the ground. Uh, Gulliver then took the parts of opening it and poured all the gold into his palm. There were six Spanish pieces of four pistols each. Whatever. But he seemed to be uh, wholly ignorant what they were. He made Ed Gulliver a sign to put them again into his purse and the purse again into oh, Gulliver's pocket, which after offering it to him several times, Gulliver thought is best to do. The farmer by the, uh, this time uh, was convinced that uh, Gulliver had uh, must be a rational creature and often spoke to him but the sound of the voice pierced Gulliver's eyes like that of the water mill yet his words were articulate enough he answered as loud as he could in several languages uh, and often laid his ear within two years of Gulliver but Oh, everything was vain as um, we were wholly unintelligible that is Gulliver was clearly the Gulliver and the farmer was completely unknown of each other's language the servants who work uh, um, sent the farmer uh, sent the servants to the work and taking he took his handkerchief out from his pocket he doubled and spread it on his left hand and placed flat on the ground and the palm upwards making Gulliver a sign to step into it as Gulliver could easily do for it was not above a foot in thickness so the he could easily do it because it was not a foot in thickness that is the uh, handkerchief Gulliver thought uh, it would be uh, good to uh, obey for fear of falling laid himself at full length upon the handkerchief so the um, farmer in this manner carried him home to his house there he called his wife and showed Gulliver to her <laughs> but the 
वोमेन स्क्रीम्ड एंड रैन बैक एज ए गलीवर से एज एनी इंग्लैंड वुड जम्प एंड मूव अबाउट मूव अवे स्क्रीमिंग वेन दिस सो अ स्पाइडर और अ टोड बट शी इन अ वाइल सो द बिहेवियर ऑफ गलीवर एंड ही ऑब्जर्व द साइंस दैट हजबेंड मेड एंड सोन शी वॉज रिकॉन्साइल्ड बाई डिग्रीज ग्रू एक्सट्रीमली टेंडर ऑफ गलीवर Uh, so it was about twelve at noon, and the servant brought in dinner. Uh, the only the substantial dish of meat uh, and everything. The company that were the group that was present was farmer, his wife. Uh, he had three children and a old grandmother. They sat down. The farmer placed uh, Gulliver at some distance from. him on the table uh, which was somewhat about 30 feet high from the floor it was a terrible fright uh, when he saw that and he kept as far as he could from the edge for he had the fear of falling the wife also crumbles some bread on a trencher and placed it it before galiva the mistress sent the maid for some um dram cup which he held to about 2 gallons to fill it with drink he took the vessel with much difficulty in both his hands in most respectful manner and drank to ladyship's health and he expressed the words as loud as he could in english which was um which led to a group of laughter okay amongst them then the master made uh, him in sign to come to his stretcher side as he walked on the table being great surprise all the time the indulgent reader he happened to stumble against a crust and fell flat on his face but received no hurt he got up immediately and observing those people who were very concerned he took his hat which and uh, his arms as good manners and waving over it but advancing forward towards his master the youngest son who sat next to him an arc boy so somewhat about 10 years old took galiver up by the legs and held him so high in the air that he tra- his every limb trembled but the farmer snatched him snatched galiver from him and at the same time gave such um, a boy on uh, such boy a tight slap or a box on the left ear he galiver was afraid that the boy might owe a spite against him so remembering how mischievous all the children among mm, his own community are and naturally are he to sparrows cats and everything puppy dogs he fell on his knees in order pointing to the boy for the master to understand that he could that he desired his son might be pardoned okay and i mean the dinner mistress a favorite cat leaped into her lap he heard a noise behind him like that of a dozen stalking weavers uh, which seemed somewhat three times larger than a ox the cat appeared to galiver that it was somewhat uh, three times larger than the ox 
the fierceness that the creature uh, faced altogether discomposed him okay he stood at the farther end of the table somewhat above 50 feet off and although his mistress held her fast there was a fear she gave a spring but it so happened that the cat took not the least notice of Gulliver when the master placed Gulliver within three yards of her and as he was told found true by his experience of travel that flying or discovering fear before the fierce animal is certain way to make it pursue or attack you so he was resolved with his dangerous juncture to show no manner of concern he walked with intrepidity he walked with intrepidity and he had less apprehension concerning the dogs whereof there were some or three or four that came into the room it is usual in farmers houses one of which was a mastiff equal the size of elephants of four elephants okay so the nurse came in uh, with a child of a year old in her arms who immediately spied at Gulliver and began to squall that at any one from London or Chelsea could, could imagine. The child who was there seized Gulliver by the middle and got Gulliver's his head into his mouth where Gulliver roared so loud that the <laughs> child was frightened and let Gulliver drop and he should have broken Gulliver's neck had not held on the apron um, if the mother had not held her apron uh, under Gulliver. Whatever the nurse to quiet the babe and rattle with everything, rattle with the kind of hollow vessel that was filled with stones or something. Uh, Gulliver confesses that there was no object of disgust in him, so as the sight of the monstrous breast that he saw, which he cannot tell to compare with what to compare with he stood prominent six feet and could not be less than 16 in circumference okay so he remembered that when he was at Lilliput the complexion of those diminutive people appeared to him the fairest in the world and now what he sees that these people are the ugliest okay because he said that um, it might be possible that it should have been possible that gulliver's face appeared to those people much fairer and smoother than he looked on him from the ground and it did upon the nearer view he could discover great holes in the skin and stumps of Gulliver's beard were ten times stronger than the bristles of a bow. So what is being presented over here? Complete opposite situation. When Gulliver was in Lilliput, he saw that those people were much more stronger and one of his intimate friends there said that Gulliver had too many pores on his face, beard stumps that was left, he could see all of that. 
The similar thing is happening with Gulliver now. He is Lilliput. He has become Lilliput in comparison to Brobdin Nag. So everything here shows is a relative one. Okay. So his complexion might be of several colors uh, to the Lilliput as he could see. Uh, them now as you could easily see these people see these Brobdingnagian people that this their color, uh, color is not just fair they are a mixture of different colors okay they are a race of people which particular features of the master countenance when after the dinner was done, the master went into went out to his labors, and as could discovered uh, from his voice and gesture, that gave his wife strict charge to take care of Gulliver. Gulliver was very much tired and disposed of to sleep. When the mistress, perceiving she put put Gulliver on her own bed and covered him with a clean white handkerchief much la which was much larger than the main sail of the uh, ship he slept somewhat about two hours and dreamt that he was home with his wife and children uh, which exerted my so uh, which exerted Gulliver's sorrows uh, the mistress uh, was gone uh, to about uh, to be indulged in some household affairs and locked Gulliver in the bed was eight yards in height from the floor some natural necessities required him to get down he does not presume to call he dared not presume to call and his voice that was was very keen was the, his loud his loudest word voice would be vain would be used in vain he lay to the kitchen where the family was kept he was under the circumstances the two rats crept up the curtains and this the ran the ran smelling backwards and forwards on the bed and one of them uh, which came almost to his face whereupon rose in a fright and drew out his hanger to defend himself the hanger is a kind of dagger or sword okay the animals that had the boldness to attack him on both sides one of them held his forefoot at and his uh, collar over there he had the good fortune to reap off one's belly before he could do any harm he could do any harm to him he fell down at his feet and the other seeing the fate of his friend that is the other rat seeing the uh, fate of his friend escaped okay after this uh, he walked gently to and, and fro on the bed to recover his breath and the loss of spirits these creatures uh, that were or the size of a large mastiff okay of normal that is of human kind he went to sleep um, he must have been torn to pieces and devoured he measured the tail of the dead rat and found it somewhat two yards long and wanting an inch so whatever is presented here is shown that whereas in Lilliput his size gives him almost godlike powers. Okay. 
allowing him to become a hero or nardak to the lilliputians in brobdin nag his different size has exactly opposite effect even his small acts of heroism like battle against the rats are seen by brobni brobdinnigians as at best tricks okay so when the mistress understood he desired to sit on the floor um the mistress soon came to the room and saw a uh, blood uh and all over there took uh, galiver in his hand <coughs> and called the maid to take up the dead rat with, with a pair of tongs and throw it out of the window um he galiver showed his hanger all bloody and wiped it on the lappet of his coat and returned to the scabbard and he praised to do more than one thing than another so uh, galiver also shows that he should be set on the floor and after that she had done his bashfulness would not suffer express himself than other he would at being taking him that is galiver again in a hand and walk to the garden where she sent uh, where she left galiver on the ground and went on to the side of the 200 years and uh, asking to her not to look or to follow o galiver he hid uh, himself between two leaves of sorrel and there discharged the necessities of nature that is he urinated so this is a particular description of his private life the benefit of public ek as well as the private life that he saw uh, without affecting his ornaments of learning of style Uh, but the whole scene of this voyage made him so strong an apprehension in his mind that he is so deeply fixed in his memory that is being said here in chapter 2 the he will be presented to the daughter and the mistress mistress's daughter that is a for also the farmer's daughter uh, we will deal with that in next class okay so have you understood in this section in this position in this chapter we see that all the almost all the situations which were there has been reversed and the satire is on the relativity satire is on the importance that one importance that one gives to himself in the position that he is in so it is not the position of people that you are in it is not the thing that you should believe that you are uh, the only important person but it is the situation that makes you important it is the political social all the conditions that are present which makes you important okay that is what being presented over here okay